Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we will be answering some questions that people post in Carnivorous Plants groups on Facebook. So let's start the video. So here we are at my office, it's literally just the kitchen because this is the best place for me to edit and record and everything because it has the best light. We're in the kitchen and we're going to be answering some questions on our Facebook groups that we have here that we're, that we're following, that many people are also on and they constantly asking questions that I hope that you guys will find useful for yourselves too. So this is going to be part of a series. I will try it out, see what you guys think. If you guys enjoy it, please let me know in the comments and then I can do this every single Friday, like a Friday FAQ or something. So let me know what you guys think about that. Let's start looking at some of the questions that people have. Our first question is, what Drostra species do you guys recommend I get? I'm looking for some new ones. So this really depends on where you are in the world, but generally you can use these same species for most climates of the world. If you can get Drostra capensis, Drostra venata, Drostra spatulata, those are super, super easy Drostra to look after. And they all grow really, really well from seeds. They're kind of like, they're like weeds basically. If, you, if you're able to grow your plants really well and you're looking after them well and your Venus flower traps and all of them together, you oftentimes find these species just growing out of nowhere in your pots and they get really annoying because what happens is that, you know, obviously you have a carnivorous plant and you enjoy growing these plants, but they're in the wrong pots and you have too many of them. And now you're at like a situation like, you don't want to throw them away, right? Because they're obviously plants that you like, but at the same time you have way too many of them and you can't give them away because you don't know enough people. and. Yeah, it, it, gets, it gets annoying, so that's why people say it's a weed, but a weed that we all love, so it's a, it's a real issue for some people. This one guy commented Drostra regii. I mean, I don't think that's really a great species to start with, but also this person didn't really say what species they have or don't have, so I guess regia is fine. And yeah, Drostra Dros regia is fine, but if you can give it the right environment, yeah, it's pretty simple. But I don't know anything about this guy, I don't know like how, I don't know how experienced they are, so that's why I just recommend some super easy one. Can my Nepenthes ventricosa eat pork, beef, or chicken? So most people who obviously hear about carnivorous plants for the first time, they think that because it's a carnivorous plant, it can eat like anything that is made out of meat. And the truth is that no, it, they can't because pork, beef, and chicken, etc., stuff that a carnivorous plant will never be able to eat anyway. So they obviously haven't evolved to it. And then secondly, these meats are so high in like, nutrients and they're so high in nutrients and they're so processed that the amount of nutrients that the plant would ex like, get exposed to when eating these types of foods is too high for the plant. And what actually happens is that it burns the traps. So, I mean, you could do it, but don't do it. It's not a good thing to do and it will damage your traps and it will hurt your plant. And anyway, why would you want like the smell of rotten meat, you know, on your plants? That's disgusting. You know, obviously they, they're, they're made to catch insects and not animals. Unless you're like an Nepenthes regi, which sometimes catch mice and small birds and stuff. No, don't do that guys. It's not good for your plants. Yeah, even people in the comments are asking why. <laughs> okay, the next question is actually a question that I asked about three days ago, it was a question about what is the most expensive cannabis plant that you either bought or heard of. And so I'll answer the question. The most expensive plant that I've ever bought was an Nepenthes Lowei, and that was 1,000 Rand, but I have no idea how much that is in dollars right now, probably like $90 or something. Uh, yeah, it was from, it was imported into the country and it was from Exotica plants. I mean, it was from Borneo Exotics, I think it was. I don't, I don't really remember remembers EP or BE, I don't, don't remember, but that's just my most expensive plant. Okay, so the next question that we have here is, this guy's asking if the sphagnum moss that he's bought will kill his plants or not because he says that it's really shitty quality. So yeah, it, it always depends on what type of quality you're getting. If you're gonna get, you know, sphagnum moss that's quite low quality, um, yeah, it, it may be a little bit suspect. It, it may have like contaminants in them. 
So the best thing to do, as he asked, is that you just take your sphagnum moss or your peat and you just rinse it in distilled or rainwater or reverse osmosis water. You just distill, I mean, you just put it in like a big tub, fill it up with water, let it soak. And if it's like peat or sphagnum, you can squeeze it like a sponge and just mix it in there really well. And then you can just pour out that water and then add some more water and then keep doing that. And then you will get any other minerals or nutrients that are in that soil and get it out so that you could use that soil. But the best way to, to avoid this is just don't buy the low quality stuff. I always recommend Best Grow for the sphagnum moss. And I use Team um, Pete. That's the brand that I use. But in America, there's quite a few brands like Hoffman, Black Gold. There's all these other brands in America that you can use for peat. Okay, so this person has recently bought a Nepenthe seedling and they don't even know what the seedling looks like. So the Nepenthe is the little green plant lit thing that is on the left here. The seedlings look like the adult plants. They have the leaf and then they have their little picture sticking up at the end of that leaf as well. The rest of the stuff is just moss. You can tell it's moss because it's, it's green and, and like moss. Yeah, and then this person obviously put this plug inside of another pot of peat and perlite, which I don't recommend for Nepenthes because they would prefer something that's a little bit more free draining and holds water less. They like to stay moist. They don't like to stay waterlogged like many of our Drossera and, and Venus flower traps do. If you can get a Nepenthes and you put in like live sphagnum moss and some orchid bark and perlite and yeah, that's actually a pretty good mix and like laker clay or something and you just top water them every single day with with clean water they'll do really really well in that instead of sitting them in water because that means that their roots will rot but yeah as i said to answer this person's question it's the leaf with the little cone at the end that's what a baby nepenthe seeding looks like yeah it's, it's if you if you've grown a nepenthe before you you should be able to tell what it is okay so here we have a nepenthe picture it's a young nepenthe because you can tell it's young because it has a small picture. It has this developing picture and this picture looks really weird. The lid of it is, is like concaved in, it looks like it's broken and everything. So, and they're asking, if, has anyone ever seen something like this before? So what I notice with Nepenthes, if you change the humidity or the light or the environment in any way, and the plant is not acclimated to that environment, the pictures sometimes come out deformed. But I don't think that this picture is coming out deformed because of the temperature changes. This is a cross of Rob Cantlii and Vichii. And I often see that even adults pictures of these guys, when their peristome and their lid is developing, the lid oftentimes squeezes inwards and then pops up, obviously once it's developed a little bit more. So this just looks like this picture is just developing like the adults do, which is kind of weird because the young pitchers don't often develop like the adults do, but it's doing that same growth habits from what I think. And I think there's nothing actually wrong with this picture. So yeah, I have seen it before, but not in, not in babies, but in the adults. So this, this, this picture actually looks fine. So this is one of the most common questions that we often get on these type of groups. Can I use miracle Grow peat for my cannabis plants, guys? And the answer to that question is no, because on the packet, it says added nutrients. And we all know that cannabis plants don't want added nutrients in their soil because these nutrients oftentimes burn up and kill your cannabis plants. So to answer the question, no, do not use Miracle Grow peat. Um, and she's using, she wants to use it for Nepenthes. Definitely don't use peat for Nepenthes because as I've said earlier, it will cause root rot in the Nepenthes. Rather use something like sphagnum moss. But she, she's obviously read the packet and she's even said that I'm, I'm assuming don't use it. So. Good, good on her, she, she realized that she mustn't use this peat and obviously she asked before she got it, which is great because then people can answer her and you know, tell her that you should never use miracle Grow because it's really bad for cannabis plants. There's not even a miracle Grow like this in Australia that I've seen and I really don't want to try it with my plants either because I'm pretty sure it will kill them. Okay, so in this post, this person addresses what I said earlier. These drostera oftentimes are weeds and this is a drostera venata. So as I've said, they really are like weeds, so I'm glad you guys can see I wasn't lying to you. This person is asking, can they put these in a bog garden so that they can like grow out and stretch everywhere without having tons and tons of babies in one pot? Oh, sorry, she actually, this person wants to put them in their own um, bog garden. So yeah, you can definitely do that. Get a bog garden. You can even use like a bucket 
just fill the bucket up with the right soil. Uh, some people put a false bottom at the bottom, but it's really your own choice. Put them in there and what will happen is that in like a year's time, you will have a massive pot full of Drosera bonata. So she has, I think she says she has five plants in this pot. So definitely you can do that, but the, the Drosera, they're not gonna really grow out uh, and creep around like she's saying. You know, sometimes they do make little plantlets and stuff, but they don't like creep around and make babies super easy, unless they flower. If they flower, there's no point putting them in the bog because all that's gonna happen is that the seeds are gonna go into the bog, you're gonna get like a, a trillion plants in that bog, and then those seeds are gonna go into your other bog gardens and you're gonna get a trillion seeds in those bog gardens too. So the best way to prevent them from growing insanely like that is just to cut off the flower stalks as soon as you see them. Sometimes you really wanna see how the flowers look. If you really, for your own sanity, if you don't wanna be dealing with that catch-22 that I was speaking of earlier, of throwing away plants or keeping all of them, just cut off the flowers and just Google how the flowers look. They aren't that special. They're just pink or white and quite small as well for these very common species. So if you wanna prevent them from, you know, overtaking everything, just cut off those flowers, guys. Okay, so over here we have one of the age old questions. My Venus flytrap is growing a flower and I've heard that the flowers kill the Venus flytrap. So the answer to this in most cases is yes, cut off the flowers because the flowers will drain your Venus flytrap of energy and your Venus flytrap will die because it has no energy to continue growing. And that, I will always say that to everyone if I don't know how experienced they are, if I don't have much info on where this, they, how the plants look, where they're growing, how they grow them, etc. But you can keep the flowers if the plant is extremely healthy and if it is a very big plant. The Venus flytrap will not grow as big as it could. It will be a little bit smaller but it will still be able to grow new traps and flower at the same time. But as I said with the Drosera bonata, why would you really wanna do that? Cut off the flower stalk when it gets about two inches tall, put that flower stalk in some soil, you have the possibility of creating a new Venus flytrap from that flower cutting, and your Venus flytrap will grow really big traps. And yeah, if you wanna see how the flowers look, just Google it, the Venus flytrap flowers are not that amazing. And anyway, you can't keep cultivars between seeds, if you wanna have a cultivar of like, for example, Venus flytrap B52, you have to divide them from roots or leaf pullings and stuff like that, or even from the flowers. If you have seeds of them, it's not the same plant, unfortunately, and it's no longer a cultivar. So yeah, just cut it off. It makes it so much easier for you and for the plant. So this is a question for everyone living in England or the UK, sorry. Can anyone recommend carnivorous plants that can live outside in the south of the UK year round. So you could you could try Venus flytrap. I obviously have never lived in the UK and I've never grown plants there, but you can try Venus flytrap. I don't see a reason why they won't be able to live there. But also Saracenia will work really well. Even Helium Fora, if you have a greenhouse and you can really control their humidity. At Kew Gardens, they have Helium Fora's just growing in their temperate section and they're growing like amazingly well there. I actually went to the UK for about two months to work there and I went to visit Kew Gardens. They have all of their Saracenias and their Heliamphoras growing outside in that temperate greenhouse, which just means that the roof is open. Really, if you just if you just remove the greenhouse, the plants will just be outside anyway. So you can definitely grow your Saracenias outside, Venus flytraps, give it a try. Even some of the more cold hardy Drosera, you can give them a try, the ones that form Habunacula, like Drosera bonata, give them a try as well. So for this next question, this lady has two Venus flower traps and she wants to know how to keep them alive because she keeps killing them. So there are about three steps, easy steps that I can tell you right now to look after your Venus flower traps. Number one is to like this video so that this video can get recommended to everyone else who enjoys the same type of content as you. Step two would be to subscribe to this channel because we give out information on carnivorous plants and Venus flower traps and how to look after them. And step three is to check out our Venus flytrap care guide that we posted about eight months ago, or whatever it was, which goes into detail in all the steps of how to look after a Venus flytrap. But in all seriousness, Venus flytraps are really not that difficult to grow. They're not that difficult to grow if you can just adhere to their basic care. If you can keep them outside, keep them outside in full sunlight. Make sure you have them in peat and perlite or peat and sand in a ratio of one is to one and just give them reverse osmosis water, distilled water, or rainwater. That's literally it, guys. Correct soil, keep them outside in the sun, 
and give them water in a tray and put the pot inside of that water tray and literally just keep that water level full almost all of the time. It's literally that easy guys and just let the water tray dry out between waterings, give it one or two days and just fill it back up. It's simple guys. So that's it for today's video guys. I did about 14 or 13 questions. If you guys enjoyed this video, please let me know in the comments. Tell me that you enjoyed this. Tell me that you want to see more of this. If there's any other questions you want me to address. If you have any of your own questions, email me. DM me on Facebook or on Instagram or in the comments just get a hold of me somehow and ask me your questions I'll be very happy to help and if you really enjoy this type of content please remember to subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click on the notification icon so that YouTube actually tells you when we make a video you know if you don't click the button YouTube just doesn't tell you and then I don't understand why they have the subscribe button if they don't tell you like where's the logic in this anyway I'll see you guys in tomorrow's episode